Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. My name is David Burton. I'm Senior Fellow in Economic Policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Our speaker today is Dr. George Aidi. His subject is How Socialism Destroyed Africa. Dr. Aidi is president of the Free Africa Foundation and for nearly 20 years was a distinguished uh, economist in residence at the American University. He's the author of six books. Uh, in chronological order, they are Indigenous African Institutions in 1991 with a revised edition in 2004, The Blueprint for Ghana's Economic Recovery in 1997, Africa Betrayed in 1992, which won the 1993 HL Macon Award for the Best Book of 1992, Africa in Chaos in 1998, Africa Unchained Blueprint for Development in 2004, and Defeating Dictators, Fighting Tyrants in Africa and Around the World in 2011. Uh, our paths first crossed uh, in 1986 when I was the editor of a journal on developmental economics called the Journal of Economic Growth, which was a, a site project. Uh, Dr. Aidi published four articles in, in that uh, journal, and uh, one was on a agriculture in, in Africa, one was a, a book review, another was a blueprint for Africa's economic reform, and the third was the political economy of reform in Africa. He has a depth and breadth of knowledge about developmental issues in Africa that I think is genuinely unmatched. Uh, he's written for many newspapers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal. He also writes a lot for African-owned publications that we're less familiar with, the African Letter, African Continent News, African News Weekly, the African Forum, among others. He has taught at Wayne State <laughs> College and Bloomsburg University in Pennsylvania before he was at AU. Uh, he held a national fellowship at the Hoover Institution in 1989 and in 19, 1988 through 1989 and was a Bradley Scholar here at the Heritage Foundation in the late 1980s. He founded the Free Africa Foundation in 1993 to, try to serve as a catalyst for reform in Africa. In 2008, Dr. Aidi was listed by Foreign Policy as one of the top 100 public intellectuals who are shaping the tenor of our time. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Economics from the University of Ghana in Ligon, an MA from the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and a PhD from the University of Manitoba. Please join me in welcoming Dr. George Aidi. Well, thank you very much, David, for uh, inviting me to this event. And I also would like to thank you for finding some time to come and listen to me. And um, as David said, I was a Bradley Scholar here at Heritage Foundation in 1989. Actually, I was on loan from uh, Bloomsburg University. I was supposed to go back after a year's stint here, but I never went back. And I'm sure you would like to know why I didn't go back, but uh, let me say that I didn't go back because the environment, the intellectual environment that was extremely very hostile towards my views. And what were my views? My sin was that I was preaching this message that African leaders had failed and betrayed their people. That was my sin back then in 1989. You may marvel at this, but Still, the political the environment and the intellectual environment is still hostile towards this particular uh, viewpoint. But we cannot sweep this under the rug. We have to say this because African salvation needs us to speak very frankly about Africa. And it's always important to make a distinction between African leaders and the African people. The leaders have been the problem, not the people. And saying that the leaders have filled Africa doesn't mean that you hate black people. <clears throat> this is important because I always tell people that, look, we've had exactly 309 
African heads of state since independence in 1960. And I will challenge anybody to name me just 20 of them who were good leaders. Of course, you mentioned us, Mandela, and a few others, but nobody can go to 20. And what does that mean? It means that the vast majority of the African leaders betrayed and failed their people. Now, back then in the 1960s, these leaders chanted, free at last, free at last. They had won independence for their respective countries. New flags unfurled to the sounds of new anthems. Currencies bore their portraits. They had fought gallantly to win independence for their respective countries. They all settled down to develop their respective countries. But with what model? That was what the million dollar question was. Did they want to uh, develop Africa using a capitalist model, a socialist model, or what model? Back then, Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana said they didn't want to use any Western institution at all. Democracy was a Western institution and an imperialist dogma. He didn't want to have anything to do with that. Now, capitalism, most of the African leaders rejected capitalism. They identified capitalism with colonialism and argued that since colonialism was evil and exploitative, so too was capitalism. So they didn't want to have anything to do with capitalism. So many of them adopted socialism as their guiding ideology to develop Africa. Nkrumah, for example, believed that only socialism can demolish the colonial structure that Ghana inherited after independence. Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, many other, in fact, even uh, Robert Mugabe, all adopted socialism. Now, by socialism was meant increasing participation of the state in the economy. It also meant they nationalized many foreign, national, uh, foreign businesses and instituted a plethora of state controls on rent, prices, foreign exchange, imports, and exports. Now, in uh, Ghana, it also meant the establishment of state-owned enterprises. Now, in Ghana and Tanzania, in Tanzania, the uh, Nyerere executed an Ujama policy, which forced peasant farmers into uh, forced peasant farmers into government villages. Nobody was, no farmer was to be able to, it was, it was illegal for farmers to sell their agricultural produce on their own. It was illegal. They had to sell their, their produce to the farmers to the government at government dictated prices. Now, what were the results of these socialist experiments? across Africa. I'd like to read to you some of the uh, results that we had. In Ghana, when Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966, there were 64 state-owned enterprises. Only four of them, four out of the 64, were paying their way. Now, in Tanzania, when the uh, introduced collectivized agriculture. Production plummeted by more than 20%. Tanzania, which used to be a food exporter, was then in 1971 importing food. Exactly the same thing happened in uh, Guinea. Guinea, at one point in 1958, when they gained independence, was exporting food 
to neighboring countries. After Sukaturi's uh, Marxism in African clothes, Guinea started to import food. In fact, four million people in Guinea fled the country to neighboring countries. In country after country, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, in Zimbabwe, the socialist experiment was a complete failure. What were the reasons for the failure? There were four main reasons. The first one was the exploitation and suppression of the peasant majority. In many countries, the peasant farmers were exploited. Take Ghana, for example. In 1984, cocoa farmers in Ghana were receiving 10% of the world market price for their cocoa. In Gambia, peanut farmers were receiving 20% of the world market price for their peanuts. Let's go all the way to Tanzania. In Tanzania, cashew nuts farmers were receiving only 30%. Now, this was uh, exploitation. It was meant to uh, extract wealth from the rural folks. And that wealth was supposed to be used for general development for the country. But it, were never, it was never done. Now, if you, if you go to uh, Ethiopia as well, Ethiopia had a villagization process where farmers were moved forcefully into government villages. Now, the result, you may remember, I remember, in the 1980s, there was farming in Ethiopia because the farmers refused to produce for, for, for government outlets. The second reason why the socialist experiment failed in Africa was because of administrative ineptitude. So many state-owned enterprises were acquired haphazardly. There was little planning, and the blunders were just horrendous. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Ghana, for example, the government set up a mango canning factory. But the capacity of that factory exceeded the entire world trade in canned mangoes. In Somalia, the Italians built a banana boxing plant. But the amount of bananas needed to make the plant break even exceeded the country's entire output of bananas. In Ghana, the government set up a state farm operations. Now, get this. The state farms in Ghana barely produce enough food to feed its own workers, let alone the nation. Now, when, God, the, when the Yugoslavia helped build another mango canning um, factory in Ghana, they discovered that the supply of mangoes came from a few trees scattered in the bush. There was no planning. And uh, Ghana also built a sh sh uh, sugar factory. And after the sugar factory was completed in 1976, it stood idle for one year because it lacked a water supply system. So many of these factories were simply put up without any planning at all. Now, there was another, some of these factories were supported by USAID and the World Bank and also many Western donors. Here's one of my favorites. Um, Norwegian, aid, uh, Norwegian aid officials helped Kenya build a fish freezing plant for the Takana tribes people in northern Kenya. They all thought that, you know, you can build a fish freezing plant, it will provide employment for the Takana tribes people, and it will also uh, provide, you know, 
uh, frozen fish for daily consumption for the Takana tribes people. They spent $21 million to, uh, to build a fish freezing plant. When it was completed in 1976, they, they discovered a very small problem. And that problem was that the Takana tribes people, they don't fish. They raise goats. It was a complete disaster in northern Kenya. Now, I can multiply this example many, many times. The third reason why the socialist experiment failed miserably in Africa was because of venal tendencies. The socialist program created with this horrendous amount of controls created shortages. And uh, the shortages provided mining opportunities for illicit enrichment by the ruling elites. For example, for example, import controls was the most lucrative. Anybody who wanted to import something into say, Ghana or Nigeria had to pay a 10% bribe to the Minister of Trade. And so the ruling elites used the socialist controls to enrich themselves. And it was not only the ruling elites, but also the, um, the leaders who were uh, pushing for the socialist agenda. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of Africans are very angry about this, because socialism, socialism is only, will only save Africa. That's what they told us in the 1960s. Only socialism will save Africa. But then guess what? The type of socialism that they practiced was a peculiar form of Swiss bank socialism that allowed the head of state and a cohort of ministers to rip and plunder their de treasuries for deposit in Switzerland. Now, go to Zimbabwe. There, in the 1980s, one of the ministers in Mugabe's government was asked, to define socialism. And he said, here yeah, in Zimbabwe, socialism means what is mine is mine. But what is yours, we share. $15 billion in Marangi diamond revenue has disappeared in Zimbabwe. They still can't find it. Go to uh, Angola. In 2017, the president of Angola Eduardo Dos Santos retired from after 38 years in office with a personal fortune of 20 billion. Now, I'm not making this up because I have documented all this in this written script. And I'm going to leave this. We're going to post this on the internet for, so that people can see. He retired with $20 billion in personal fortune. His own daughter, Isabel Dos Santos, is well. $2.4 billion. They call themselves socialists, some socialists. This is a type of socialism which was practiced across Africa. Go to Mozambique. $2 billion in loans have vanished in that socialist country. Now, the fourth reason why socialism failed, failed because socialism as an ideology is alien to Africa. You cannot defend socialism upon the basis of African tradition. All the means, if you go to Africa, all the means of production are privately owned. It's important that we understand this because the leadership in Africa did not understand their own African heritage. Here in America, the basic and economics. The basic economic and social unit is the individual. The American says, I am because I am. And I can damn well do anything I want. Now, in Africa, the African says, I am because we are. The we means the extended family or the community. So when you go to Africa and you ask, who owns this land? The African will say, the land belongs to us. The first Europeans who had this misinterpreted it out to mean the land belongs to Tom Dick and Harry in the village. That was not the case. It meant the land belongs to him. 
and its extended family. The extended family in Africa acts as the corporate unit and owns the land and determines what can be what can be grown on the land, etc. But the extended family is a private entity. It is not a tribal government. That is a distinction which Nyerere did not make and brought about a lot of confusion. There were free markets in Africa, free trade and free enterprise in Africa before the white man stepped foot on the continent. So you cannot go to Africa and preach that kind of socialism to the African people because it is totally alien to their fundamental indigenous culture. That was the third reason, the fourth reason why socialism failed. Now, if you go to, you know, go to Zimbabwe, the devastation that socialism left there is for everybody to see. In Zimbabwe, after 1980s, 1990s, the Mugabe government decided to forcibly seize land without compensation and destroyed the uh, agriculture and the export crops that you had in that particular country. Now, there was so much inflation in Zimbabwe that um, the rate of inflation reached 2 million percent and the Zimbabwe currency collapsed completely and they had to adopt the U.S. currency, the dollar. Now, move next door to South Africa, and South Africa seeks to repeat the catastrophic mistakes that we made in, uh, elsewhere in Africa. South Africa wants to amend the constitution and use that constitution to seize commercial land. South Africa break away from the ruling uh, ANC, the Economic Freedom Fighters, seek to nationalize the Central Bank of South Africa and also nationalize all new discoveries of oil and gas in South Africa. Now, this is inexplicable. You know, uh, Albert Einstein once said that, you know, Insanity is doing the same thing again and again and again and expecting different results. But lunacy can be defined as doing the same stupid thing again and again and expecting the same stupid results. You don't have to go very far from uh, South Africa to see the devastation that socialism left across Africa. Now, and the reason why I'm speaking forcefully about this was that socialism left two pernicious legacies across Africa. The first one was it created this mentality that it is government that must solve all problems. So if you advance any problem, it's the government which comes up with a solution for it. Tell the government to cut government spending, and it will set up a ministry of less government spending. This actually happened in Mali. Tell the government to improve transparency. In Tanzania, set up a Ministry of Good Governance. Tell the government to place more reliance on the private sector. And this is what Ghana, Ghana did. In 2004, Ghana set up a Ministry of Private Sector Development. Now, that mentality is still pervasive in Africa, and that is the government hasn't solved problems. The government has been the problem in Africa. The second enduring legacy that socialism left is that socialism entailed the establishment of an infrastructure to give effect to socialism in Africa. Now, that infrastructure, 
was never dismantled. It is still in place in many parts of Africa, and that has led to a phenomenal expansion of government bureaucracy. Now, in country after country, you're dealing with bloated bureaucracy. In uh, Zimbabwe, you have at least 74 ministers and deputy ministers. In Angola, 80 ministers and deputy ministers. Kenya, 68. In Ghana, the number has reached 110. Now, all this bloated bureaucracy absorbed wages and salaries. In African governments, in Ghana, we spend 70% of the government budget on wages and salaries. In Zimbabwe, it's almost 80%. In Angola, it's also 70%, which means that the government has very little left for um, development expenditure. So the government has become so bloated that, you know, the socialist ideology created an infrastructure which is still very much in place. Now, one of the things that we need to do if we want to move Africa forward is to find a way by which we can uh, dismantle this socialist ideology and the infrastructure that is still strangulating many African uh, economies in Africa. And I'd like to end here, and I'm sure that you have plenty of questions to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Uh, we do have time for some questions. Let me just say a couple quick things. First off, uh, a written version of this uh, talk will be available on our webpage in the next day or so uh, on the event page where you would also watch the event. Um, I would ask that anyone who's going to ask a question, please state their name and any institutional affiliation, and if you could just raise your hand. Steve. Steve Anton, Tax Foundation. Uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the Western universities, such as London School of Economics, Sorbonne, and others, uh, to which many uh, African students went, uh, were very much socialist in their teachings about economic development. Has any of that changed in recent years? I'm very much aware of the role that the London School of Economics played in terms of, um, I think back then there was an innocent uh, mistake that was made in the terms of uh, believing that Back then, they felt that you know the market was not strong enough, and that if you needed to develop Africa, you needed to work with African governments, and therefore, um, uh, socialism and um, was a way to go because uh, colonialism has left Africa and did not leave Africa. Africa developed, so there was. Um, I think you know the the need for uh, government to become very much more involved in economic development. But since then, I don't think that you know the London School of Economics has really uh, has shed its socialist roots, and I think that it still continues to dispense that kind of uh, I'll call it vile message to various African countries and leaders. This gentleman back here. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayite. It's Fred Olade and Day with the Foundation for Democracy in Africa. <clears throat> and uh, my question is, we have seen since the 60s and up to date that the voices of liberty and freedom among citizens may have been responsible for the inept and irresponsibility of government the creation of Free Africa Foundation and other institutions has been to try to create the space 
for civil society in Africa to be able to use electoral democracy, elections, to effect the kind of change that would allow free enterprise and liberty uh, to be as prominent as possible. From your experience and from the level of high exposure and research that you've done, why haven't we been able to concretize civil society presence so that we can deter this inept bureaucracy uh, current in Africa, at least going forward? And how do you see the new Trump administration uh, policy on Africa assisting to limit the socialist, communist effects in Africa? Thank you. Oh, yeah, that was, uh, Fred, that was a very good question. And uh, you and I have been in this battle for a very, very long time. And uh, you've done a, a, a yeoman's job in trying to push for uh, the creation of uh, space for uh, civic organizations like yours, you know, to push for democracy and also for reform. But progress has been limited. And uh, one of the reasons why progress has been limited, three reasons in my view. The first one is that, um, and again, it's uh, still the uh, part of the socialist legacy in the sense that most people, whenever there is a problem in Africa, most people tend to look up to the government or expect the government to come and solve it. So. Uh, we're not relying more on the private sector. We're looking up to the government. If there are too many, uh, uh, if the roads don't work or things don't work, we blame the government. So there's still that kind of socialist mentality of looking up for the government to come and solve the problems for us. Now, the second reason also is that um, um, in order to create space for groups, uh, civic groups like that, you know, you need to have reform. But we haven't had much reform in Africa because the leadership there are not really interested in reform. I mean, uh, you push them to reform, and they perform what I call the babangida boogie, one step forward, three steps back. They're not interested in reform because they know they have done bad. Look, they, if they open up the civic space for people like you and me, we're going to expose their corruption and we're going to expose their human rights abuses. So they're not going to open up that space. They're not going to do that in Zimbabwe. They're not going to do that in Angola and other African countries. So they all, they all you know, put up these cosmetic changes of reform to satisfy the uh, World Bank and the IMF to show that they are doing something, but they're really not serious in doing something. Look, if you want to cut, like I said, if you want to cut government spending, you cut down government spending. You don't put up a ministry of less government spending. These guys are not serious. Now, and the third um, reason why we haven't made much space is that um, and on this one, I, like, I, I blame the uh, wealthy Africans, rich Africans. I think rich Africans should be supporting uh, the uh, movement for change in Africa. And, um, uh, um, and I think, you know, uh, they should be supporting people who are trying to bring uh, a much freer environment in terms of promoting you know, free enterprise in Africa, they should be supporting this, the efforts to open up Africa. And I think uh, rich Africans have, been, have not been very active in this particular effort. That's Terry. Uh, thank you very much. Terry Miller with the Heritage Foundation. Um, you've presented a really damning um, indictment of, of socialism and the entrenchment of corruption in African countries. 
Um, could you speculate a little bit or offer us some of your ideas about a potential pathway out of this? And particularly if there's a role for the United States, um, either the private sector or the United States government or international organizations like the World Bank. Thank you very much. That's a very good question. And that is, um, well, I didn't choose to be uh, to be very to give a very uh, uh, a serious indictment of socialism because it hasn't worked in Africa, and I can't lie to you. We don't have any uh, uh, successful socialist country in Africa. We don't, and um, but we do have some countries which are doing very well, and the path. The path to African prosperity. Well, let me. This is what we did in post-colonial Africa. What we did was um, we rejected our own and went abroad and copied all sorts of alien institutions to impose upon our people. Rome has a basilica, so we built one in Yamasukro in Arikos. The U.S. has space center, so we built a space center in Nigeria. We built one in uh, Zimbabwe as well. France once had an emperor, so Bokasa in 1975 spent $25 million to crown himself an emperor. American farmers used tractors, so we also imported tractors into Africa. New York has skyscrapers, so we also copied and build skyscrapers in Africa in the middle of nowhere. I can go and multiply all the, so many of these. Nigeria, Babangida, um, one said that the U.S. has two political parties, so he created exactly two parties for Nigeria in 1993, one a little bit to the left, one a little bit to the right. Now, if you look at the continent of Africa, it is littered with the uh, carcasses of all these foreign uh, systems that we imported and brought into Africa. They didn't work. So what is the way forward? I have always argued in my books that uh, the way forward is for Africa to go back and build on its own indigenous institutions. What are its indigenous institutions? There were free markets in Africa. I don't have to tell you that. You can go to any Africa, African country. Go to the village market. You'll find a village market there. Market activity in African villages have been dominated by women for centuries. That's part of our culture. That's part of our history. There was free enterprise in Africa. There was also free, free trade in Africa. All these institutions are there. We never build upon them because the uh, first generation of African leaders said free trade, free enterprise, and free, uh, free markets were Western institutions. In fact, in 1982, we were blowing up markets in Ghana. Why? Because uh, the military dictator at that time, Jerry Rollins, dismissed markets at dens of profiteers and was blowing them up. Now, the only African country that went back and built upon its uh, indigenous institutions was Botswana. And it is doing very well. We don't have to go to uh, Asia to copy their model. The model that we need to copy is right there in Africa, in Botswana. That's what we need to copy. And that is the way forward, by building upon our own indigenous institutions of free markets, free enterprise and free trade. Okay, any other questions? This gentleman in the center. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my name is Alexander Hammond from the Cato Institute. Um, so building on from that, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, hope it's expected to be implemented in the next couple of weeks or so, depending on ratifications. So just your thoughts on that, if it's a good thing for Africa, if it's a glimmer of hope for the continent. Yeah. 
let me get that again. The uh, the uh, African. Uh, What's the name of the agreement again? The African Continental Free Trade. Yeah, yeah. and uh, what's your question about that? Yeah, it's an excellent idea. I'm all for it. As an economist, I'm all for it. That we should have a free trade agreement and consumption across Africa. And as a matter of fact, you know, I always say that look, in pre colonial Africa, we didn't have any barriers. I mean, we traded freely among ourselves. There was one trans Saharan free, free trade routes. In fact, there were free trade routes crisscrossing the continent that moved people and trade our goods around without any hindrance at all. So this is what we should have in Africa. So I'm all for it, but right now, that free trade agreement, Nigeria is opposed to it. South Africa doesn't want to sign on to it. And uh, also, we need to put do some preparatory work and do our homework well. You just don't get up and say that uh, we've signed a free trade agreement. That's what the AU did in terms of, you know, you want to make sure that you harmonize trade. I mean, if you're in, let's say, Cape Town, for example, how do you sell goods in Kampala? You want to make sure that at least you have uh, uh, roads that can lead you from Cape Town to Kampala or you have railways that can link you, or even telephones that can link you, or at least you have some uh, common banking system or currencies. You see, we haven't done that kind of uh, homework to make sure that we can facilitate that kind of trade. I mean, look, even look at West Africa, for example. West Africa, we're supposed to have ECOWAS, and we're supposed to trade free, freely among ourselves. But even if you want to move from, uh, say, Dakar to Lagos, it's almost impossible because you don't even have one, one road that would take you through all these countries to go there. So, sure, we need to have the custom union. That is something which will boost African development very, very, very fast. But we haven't done the preparatory work. Maybe we should start with the... Uh, regional uh, economic units like ECOWAS in West Africa and also the East African economic uh, community and then the Southern African economic community. Make sure that those regional units are working before we bring all of them, the three of them together for a continental free trade uh, area. Hi, anybody else? This gentleman. Hi, Eric Myers with uh, Global Cultiva. You talked about one of the legacies of, of, uh, of well, socialism and communism in, in Africa is the, is the bureaucracy, the ingrained. You talked about the 110 ministers, I think it was in Angola. But how do you go about changing that when to get, to come to power there, you have, you're a product of that system and you probably wouldn't be the leader unless you promised a lot of people those ministries and that thing, my point is, you don't become the leader unless you play that game. So now you're a product of that system. How do you go about changing that? That's, that's, that's the, uh, that is the million-dollar question. And, um, and that is what I said, that, you know, it's going to be an enduring legacy which is going to hold us back. Because I am all for, and I'm sitting on my pins and needles wishing that Abiy Ahmed of Ethiopia can succeed because one of the ways by which you can bring reform, we want to make sure that um, uh, reform is not too much, you know, identified with one person. Because if you are too much identified with one person, people it will give people the idea that if they get rid of you, uh, then they will they will be home free. Look, let's face it. Uh, and let's face fact, in many African countries, we don't have a government. What we have is what I call a vampire state or a mafia state. It's a criminal enterprise. 
if you want to understand how the real, why the real U.S. is rich and Africa is poor, ask yourself this question. How do the rich in the two places make their money? Here in the U.S., the richest person is Jeff Bezos. He's the owner of Amazon.com. He has something to show for his wealth. Now, let's go to Africa. Who are the richest? The richest are heads of state and ministers. And quite often, the chief bandit is the head of state himself. It's a criminal enterprise. So how do you reform that system? How does the head of state reform that system? Even if he does, uh, does he get rid of the ministers? Look at what is going on in uh, um, Angola. You have Lorenzo, who was part of the um, Dos Santos uh, ruling elite. I don't know how... Um, can he really clean up the system? Well, he's trying, but he can't go very far. Look at Zimbabwe. How do you clean up the system in Zimbabwe? The current president of Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa, was Mugabe's own right-hand security chief some time ago. A lot of money has disappeared in Zimbabwe. Mnangagwa knows where the dead bodies are buried. How can he clean up the system? He can't. So, but until we clean up that system, the system doesn't have any legitimacy. Until we clean that system and throw the rascals out, the rot will continue. And without reform, let me tell you this, more African countries will blow up. Look at Sudan. Look at Tunisia. Now, we're going to go through this cycle again and again and again. Look, um, in Sudan, for example, you have uh, uh, Al-Bashir. The man has been there for 30 years and counting. He is worth more than $7 billion. Is he going to step down? He's, he doesn't want to step down. But if he doesn't step down, the country will blow up. Look at Uganda. Back in 1986, President uh, Museveni said, no African leader should be in power for more than 10 years. That was what he said in 1986. Now look at him. So how do you clean up that system? At one point, you know, I almost gave up and I said, look, maybe what we can do is to tell them that, hey, look, we know you have done bad, so here is $1 billion. Take it and get the hell out of the way. And then I leave, leave Vamoose, go somewhere. But then it will be uh, encouraging corruption, and it will be encouraging the same rot. Because if you do that, how do you prevent the next rat from coming and saying that, hey, buy me out too? And then it becomes a cycle and cycle. But, you know, this is the African, I call it the African reform conundrum. We have to find a way by which we can, either we can get, you know, the current uh, leaders who are there to reform the system or find a way by which we can gently move them out of the way. You don't want to do this violently, you know, through a revolution or through a rebel insurgency because that ends up destroying the country. Look at uh, Somalia. It hasn't been without a government since 1991. The country is virtually destroyed. Look at Central African Republic. Look at uh, Congo. Now, Congo is also a... No, look, Congo is a, a country which breaks my heart. It has so much mineral wealth that the country shouldn't even be starving at all. But there are no roads in Congo. And uh, the mineral wealth of Congo has just been plundered. They held elections, I mean, last December. And the, the, the elections were twice postponed. And when they held the elections, they said we were going to postpone elections in three, uh, in three opposition-held areas. And those elections will be held in March 29th. But then, 
when they had the elections, they declared the results in, um, they declared the results February 15th, before the three, the other three areas had held their elections. I mean, what kind of nonsense is this? This is a type of, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it, 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 it's, it defies common sense. The kind of buffoonery that is going on in several African countries, that doesn't make sense at all. And that is holding Africa back. And, you know, the, um, the sad aspect of it is that you have an organization, the African Union, which is completely useless. It is not, you know, as compared to uh, the organization of American states, the Latin American counterpart is far more effective in at least enforcing transparency and some democratic principles than the African Union. So I think we're going to be wallowing in mud for some time to come. I'm sorry to say this, because Africa has a great deal of potential that needs to move the continent forward. Anybody else? This gentleman in the front and in the back, and then that'll be it. <clears throat> Don't you think that all of the problems do you set for regarding Africa, corruption, mismanagement, all of them has been created by Western countries, by colonizing countries, and it's not also the, limited to Africa. Right now, most of the countries in the world, unfortunately, that issue of corruption and uh, is prevalent. And the other matter is that where do they get their money to take their money when they have the, uh, there is corruption? You see, they come, they go to the Europe, to London, or over here. So what, what's the uh, uh, solution for that? Well, uh, that is what the bandits want us to hear. And also that's what the bandits want us to believe that you know, Mobutu, for example, Mobutu uh, was uh, Africa's richest kleptocrat of Congo DR. And he amassed a personal fortune of $10 billion. Now, his personal fortune of $10 billion when he was in power exceeded his own country's foreign debt of $7 billion, meaning that he could have written a personal check to pay off his country's entire foreign debt, and then some. Of course, he didn't need social security. When he was asked in 1984 who introduced corruption into Congo, he said, well, it was the European business people who said, I sell you this thing for $200, then I put uh, $20 into your Swiss bank account. Total nonsense. Look, we're having all these problems in Africa because the leadership instituted or put in place defective institutions and systems. Defective institutions and systems. Uh, let's take the political system, for example. If you create a political system in which you concentrate a great deal of power in the hands of one individual, that system, no matter where you are, would tend to would degenerate into tyranny or dictatorship. That's what we had in most of Africa's uh, post-colonial African countries. Many of the post-colonial African countries after independence established one-party state systems. No opposition parties were allowed in those one-party state systems. Now let me, let me give you the statistics. In 1990, 30 years after independence, only four African countries were democratic. Those four countries were Botswana, Senegal, Gambia, and Mauritius, four. Now remember that 
We fought for our freedom from colonial rule. Where was it? Only four in 1990. Now, it was not only a defective political system, but they also established defective economic system. Now, that defective economic system bore no affinity to our own traditional economic system of free markets and free enterprise. But none, none whatsoever. You can't justify socialism upon the basis of African tradition. Now, so we had all these problems because the leadership created these defective systems and imposed them on their people. The colonialists did not create one-party state systems for Africa. The leadership, the leaders did that themselves. So blame the leaders, not the colonialists. It was the leaders who stole Africa's money and put it in Swiss banks, not the colonialists. So blame the leaders. The ones standing on my neck were not the colonialists, they were African leaders. So let's place responsibility where they belong. All right, this is a final question. If you could try to make it brief, please. Thank you very much, Dr. Aide. I was just going to ask, based on your answer, not to the last question, the one before, are there any lessons learned, particularly from the United States transformation, where we know not in the far past we had the rubber baron era <laughs> that Congress was able uh, through election of, if you may, more free market politicians to be able to limit the oligo oligopo oligo oligopoly uh, uh, control of different sectors of our economy. Are there any le lessons learned that we could use in assisting in the transformation and opening that space for private sector and civil society in Africa? Can we learn from the experience of the United States? Well, give me a second. I think um, um, I have been uh, <coughs> I've spent a lot of time here and I've been to uh, Congress and I've testified so many times before congressional committees trying to help and it's been very very frustrating frustrating in the um, in a sense that in fact, I met uh, with the uh, Secretary of uh, State, uh, Hillary Clinton. Once he asked, she asked me uh, what can the U.S. do to help Africa, and I told her that the U.S. doesn't have to reinvent the wheel, and that the U.S. should do to, for Africa what the U.S. did for the former Soviet Union. And that is um, uh, where the West established Radio Free Europe. And I said, Radio Free Africa would do wonders for Africa because here in the West, the West, Americans take their freedom of expression and of the media for granted. But in Africa, radio is very powerful. It's a very powerful means of uh, communication. And that's why African leaders or governments go and control it. Get the media out of the hands of corrupting, competent governments in Africa. And you see the changes that that will make in Africa. And that is, look at Ethiopia. Ethiopia, for a long time, used to have only one radio station for the entire country of 80, 80 million people. The radio is controlled in Eritrea. And um, in uh, Congo, when they were having elections, the uh, Congolese government blocked access to the radio and also to the to the internet. They control this because they know how powerful the means of communication is. Get that, unblock that, and let Africans have access to alternative sources of 
um, news, and that will be able to uh, break the monopoly that uh, these leaders have. And that is where I think, uh, Fred, this is where you and I, you are doing a fantastic job in promoting democracy. You and I know that the kind of work that you're doing, you would never be able to do that in many African countries, not in uh, Zimbabwe, not in Angola, not in uh, Mozambique, not in Eritrea, none. We ought to be able to be, be able to be doing this kind of work in pushing for reform in our own African countries without fear. But I can name you countries of our countries of our countries where journalists have been killed in uh, Mozambique because they exposed corruption. Journalists have been killed. I mean, uh, in Eritrea, almost all the uh, private journalists are now languishing in jail. In Ethiopia, there used to be, even bloggers were thrown in, in jail until Abiy Ahmed came and uh, uh, released almost all those pol political free prisoners. We need to have, in order for civil, civil society to do its work, it needs to have space, and it also needs to have freedom of expression. The freedom of expression, this is guaranteed by Article 9 of Africa's own Charter of Human and People's Rights, the, OAU, the AU's own Charter, but nobody enforces that. And I've always said that, look, you know, what the West can do is to say that, look, any African country that does not respect that particular law of uh, freedom of expression. It's also Article 19 of the United Nations own uh, Charter of Universal Human Rights. The United Nations can help Africa by throwing out of uh, the United Nations any country that does not respect that particular Article 9, 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Freedom of expression is the mother of all freedoms. That is what we need and in Africa, Fred to push for uh, democracy, and to push for free markets, and to push for other reforms that we need. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Aidi. Thank you all for coming. This concludes our event.